Good morning, Grace. We're the Heim family. <laughs> we want to welcome you this morning. We're actually visiting family, coming to you from beautiful Lockport. Yeah, <laughs> Lockport, New York. This morning, Pastor Ben is going to share a special message about Psalm 84, about God's dwelling place, his home, and how, and how he inhabits he us. And how he loves us. And how he loves us. And how when we are gathered and interact with each other, he is in our presence. And how he loves us right. in our whole hearts. That's wow. right. Welcome, Welcome to, to Grace. Grace. Good morning, Grace. Uh, we're going to sing a song this morning that was written over 200 years ago, but the story of the song still relates to us today because it's a story of Jesus and what he's done for us. Um, there's a line in the song that says, Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the folds of God, but he to rescue me from danger and opposed by his precious blood. So let's sing this morning. And just as a reminder, this is the time right now as we sing this music, this is the time for you um, to remember what God has done for you to kind of quiet your mind or even just get in that right place. So do what you need to do, but I'm still gonna invite you to sing with me this morning. Come thou fount of every blessing to my heart to sing thy grace. Dreams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise Teach me some melody sonnet Sung by flaming tongues above Embrace the mountain, fix the pawning Mount of thy Like a feather by my wandering heart to thee And prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it Prone to leave the God I love Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it Seal it for thy thoughts above can seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Well, Ben is uh, reminding us this morning in his message that God dwells within us. Um, in this next song, let's pre just prepare our hearts um, to God to let him work in us and through us. <laughs> Find me now 
Where the grace runs as deep as the scars You pulled me from the clay You set me on a rock You call me by your name And made my heart whole again Lift it up my knees know it's all for your glory That I might stand With more reasons to sing than to fear You pulled me from the clay You set me on a rock You called me by your name Made my heart whole again So here I stand High and surrender I need you now Hold my heart Now and forever My soul cries out Once I was broken my whole heart Sin has no hold on me Cause your grace holds me now And that grace On the ground where the grave did Where all my shame Left for dead in your way Your grace holds me now. Oh, your 
Grace owes me now. Grace owes me now. Oh, grace owes me now. Hey, everybody, we're going to take a moment and pray about the requests that you have sent in to us. We pray about them every Tuesday in the Grace staff meeting. But first, I would like to acknowledge some wonderful answers to prayer that we received. A lot of people have asked us to pray about housing, and I've got some really great news for you. Some of those boxes about housing have been checked off because people have found great housing solutions. We have a family that's been praying about the father coming back home because he's been away because of work. He's back home. We've got a mother who really needed child care for her young child, and it was kind of one of those against all odds situations, but that's been solved. Huge answer to prayer. Another mom was praying about mental illness for her son. Her son has been suffering, and the great news is, is that's let up. He's doing much better. We had a young professional who lost their job and just got it back. That's great news. Finally, and there's a lot more, I'll just say this. A bunch of us have been praying for baby Nora, little beautiful baby girl. It's been so sick in the hospital. She's back home. This is awesome. Well, listen, Psalm 84 is the psalm for today. It's the psalm that we're studying. And in verse number eight, it says, hear our prayer, O Lord God Almighty. And so we're just gonna come in alignment with that as we pray about the many requests that have come in. So please, there's power in corporate prayer. So please join me in these next few moments as we pray about some really important things. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray Psalm 84. Hear our prayer, O Lord God Almighty. This virus, end it. Racial injustice, remove it. For those who are hurting, loneliness and depression and hopelessness. There are financial struggles. There's health struggles. There are more people who need housing. Along with an array of all kinds of other issues, Almighty God, we bring this before you, we ask. Hear our prayer. We thank you for the many, many answers. It's so awesome to hear that good news. And Father, we bring these before you, and we ask, Lord, that you would go to work on each one of these. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you for praying with me. Galatians chapter five, verse number one says this, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Jesus Christ is all about freedom. He's all about freedom. Well, this weekend's all about freedom, isn't it? And it's also today, today, the anniversary of one of the greatest speeches in American history and the greatest speech of Frederick Douglass. It was on July the 5th, 1852, that Frederick Douglass, who was born in Southern Maryland, escaped slavery at the age of 20, worked his way up to Massachusetts, eventually relocated to Rochester, New York. He was invited to speak July 5th, 1852, in Rochester at Corinthian Hall. And he begins his speech by praising his audience and then praising the founding fathers, the framers of the Constitution. He believed the United States Constitution in its very spirit was an anti-slavery document. But after he gets through that opening, he asks a very important question. He says, what is July 4th to a slave? And he quotes the 137th Psalm, which says, by the rivers of Babylon. Now, why is that so important? Because the Israelites were in exile. They were enslaved in the 137th Psalm. By the rivers of Babylon, Babylon had come in and destroyed Jerusalem, had taken many of those who lived there away, and had enslaved them. And so he begins that way. Matter of fact, some scholars say, that almost 70% of the Hebrew Bible is about exile and slavery. Think about that, 70% almost. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Lamentations, Daniel, Exodus, and on and on it goes, either enslaved or getting out of slavery and dealing with the aftermath of slavery. The Bible is all about freedom. 
Galatians 5.1, it is for freedom's sake that Jesus Christ has set us free. Jesus Christ is all about freedom. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ or you're thinking about being a follower of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is all about freedom. Now, listen, humanity has a long track record of creating and celebrating freedom for some. Creating and celebrating freedom for some, but Jesus Christ is so unique. He wants to create freedom for all people, not some people. And so what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus Christ? What does it mean to reflect Jesus Christ? It means that we pray about freedom, not for some, for all. It means that we pursue freedom, not for some, for all. It means that we take pleasure and joy and we lift up and we praise and we give thanks when there's freedom, not for some, for all. This is what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ, to reflect him. So this week, as we're thinking about, you know, July 4th weekend, as we move into next week, would you make that your prayer? Would you pray all of this week, God, bring freedom for all people. Bring justice for all people. God, put it inside of me to take great joy and pleasure, to be inspired by you. Freedom, freedom for all people. Now, Frederick Douglass ends his speech this way. He quotes Isaiah 59, verse number one. The arm of the Lord is not too short. And this is what he says. The arm of the Lord is not shortened and the doom of slavery is certain. I will therefore end where I began with hope. I want you to feel hopeful today. Frederick Douglass felt even in the midst of America that was enslaved at that time, he felt there was great hope because of Jesus Christ. Because God is a restorer and a deliverer and he comes to set us free. Let's pray about that. Let's be hopeful on that. And let's remind ourselves all this week it is for freedom's sake that Christ has set us free. Now, Pastor Ben is going to preach from Psalm 84. Thanks for participating today. God bless. How much can you learn about a person by their house? Good morning, my name is Ben, and today's Psalm will help you to answer the question in the back of your mind, if God had a house, what would it be like? We all have experiences living in a house. Some of us have lived in a big house or a small house, a new house, maybe an old house with character, maybe a house high up in the city or out in the countryside surrounded by acres of land. Some of us can't stand the thought of one more day stuck in our house <laughs> and we're getting out into tents and RVs and cabins and, you know, I don't know anyone who lives on a boat, but if that's you, please feel free to email me so that we can be friends. There are so many different kinds of houses, and I got to see a lot of them at my last job. I was working as a custom closet designer. I would show up every day to a new address with my training, my tools, my 3D software to meet a complete stranger who would then lead me to the most intimate room in their home, <laughs> their closet. I got to learn a lot about people. Actually, it was learning about people that quickly became my favorite part of the job, helping people get organized it's really fun. I do enjoy that. But there's something special about meeting somebody within the context of their home. It's, it's like you automatically know them on a deeper level than if you were to just meet them on the street. The home, it holds so many details about the one who lives there. It's practically an extension of their being. The fridge door, it shows you who they care about. The accomplishments hanging on the wall, it shows you what they're proud of. The TV channel that's on in the background, that shows you what they're interested in. There's tons of information around you. And this was helpful to me because what I can see about the home tells me what I can expect as the guest in the home. For example, if, if I open the door and there's, I see dog toys on the ground in the house, that tells me I should be taking my shoes off outside on the porch or else go on a treasure hunt at the end of my appointment for a lost shoe. <laughs> Why am I telling you this? Because we all want to know God better. Right now watching this, there are hundreds of people gathered in their homes to seek Jesus. And that's amazing. Thank you. There are lots of ways that we can learn about God. But I'm telling you, if you can experience God in his house, you're going to know God on a much deeper level. So today, we are going to explore God's house together. And my prayer is that we would realize something new about the owner, 
and gain a sense for our mysterious connection to this divine property. 3,000 years ago, during the reign of kings in Israel, a song was written, but it was no ordinary song. Its lyrics allowed people to experience God. And those lyrics have survived centuries and are in our Bibles today under the title Psalm 84. The lyrics in this song tell the story of a guest arriving to God's house from the perspective of the guest. This should be a fun perspective for us to explore because if you've ever seen um, in a scary movie, the scariest parts are not when they show you the monster, but when they show you these close-ups of the person's face who is afraid of the monster. So in a similar way, this psalm gives us a close-up of the guest who visits God's house, and that helps you and me to feel a certain way. The story in this song is organized like a modern action movie. Right off the bat, verses one through four, we're caught up in the middle of the action. The guest has just arrived at the house. And then in verses five through seven, the guest reflects on the journey it took him to get there. Uh, Then in verses eight through 12, we pick up again from the last moment uh, and we enter God's house. We meet the owner. So let's begin verse one. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. And we just have to pause here because the name for God here, Lord Almighty, can also be translated to Lord of hosts, Lord of angel armies. It's a title of authority. There's power. There's, it, it assumes this ability to fight and protect, which is a theme that we will see reinforced and contrasted throughout the song. And then the phrase, my soul yearns, even faints, That's made up of two Hebrew words that both are forceful in meaning, but even more so together. The first suggests desperation, and the second implies that the character was consumed by the feeling. Together, they suggest the person was torn apart by the longing. One commentary describes this feeling as being homesick or lovesick. The character in this song is painfully longing for something. And what is it? We see right here in the first section, the courts of the Lord and the living God. But why does the psalmist mention the courts first instead of God? Like, isn't that rude? (laughs) You're longing for God's stuff more than God himself? Actually, it's not like that. Uh, God's stuff and God himself, they kind of go together. If you ask, if you ask any teenager right now who is missing out on their summer camp this year, they will know exactly what it means to be longing for the place and the people. They kind of go together. By the way, the word here for courts It does not mean courtrooms, but courtyards. Uh, You're not inside, you're outside in some kind of enclosed yard area. Um, And this is great news for me because with my history of speeding tickets, I don't really really yearn for courtrooms. But can I tell you about the most beautiful courtyard I've ever seen? It was about this time last year, your generous support sent a youth mission trip to Guatemala to drill a well. And on our way to the mission house, we got to stay at a place in the city of Antigua, Beautiful city, massive volcanoes, paint the backdrop as you ride into town on these cobblestone roads, which, by the way, turn you and every passenger in the car into a bobblehead. <laughs> there's, there's no speeding ticket to be earned in that city. The roads, they're shaped like corridors, surrounded on both sides by these tall concrete walls that are painted in bright colors to kind of section off where the residences are behind. Uh, we, we stopped finally and got out to knock on this heavy wooden door that opens to reveal this small, dark hallway like a cave. And when you walk through that, you are standing in a beautiful courtyard. It's open to the sky with two stories of house wrapped around it. There was seating, there was greenery around the perimeter, a small pool in the corner, and all the rooms had windows that looked out onto the courtyard. And here's the cool thing about a courtyard. When you're in the courtyard, it becomes clear where to find what you need. A courtyard gives you access to everything in the house. There's the kitchen. There's the the bathrooms. There's the garage bay. There's the bedrooms. There's the stairs that go up to the balcony. If you can get yourself to the courtyard, the path will reveal itself. God's house is designed to provide easy access to the things that we need. Let's continue reading in verse 3. Even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young a place near your altar, Lord Almighty, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. 
I, I wonder if this song had a music video, if this would be the point where you see like a bird come in and fly right by the character's head to catch their attention. And we see the bird makes its nest by the altar, which represents provision. God's house, it's an inviting place. You got animals coming in to, to stay there. And, and it's a, a place of provision. Um, and whoever dwells there is so blessed that they can't stop praising God. Verse five continues, blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of tears, they make it a place of springs. And the autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Our character with God as their strength and a sacred mission in their heart has been through a journey of tears and springs and pools. Kind of resembles baptism when you think about it. Until finally they are before God to make one request, just one, right here in verse 8. Hear my prayer, Lord Almighty. Listen to me, God of Jacob. Look on our shield, O God. Look with favor on your anointed one. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. If you remember a few weeks ago, we learned from Pastor John that blessed in Hebrew, it means deeply satisfied. Three times in this psalm do we see a description of the satisfied soul in connection to God and his house. Do you want satisfied soul? There is deep satisfaction for those who dwell in God's house, verse 4, who find their strength in God, verse 5, and who trust in God, verse 12, in God, in God. God wants to be your house. And here's something else that's true. God wants you to be his house. Colossians 2, 9 through 10 puts it this way. For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. So you also are complete through your union with Christ. The fullness of God lives in you. Jesus said it this way. Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. God dwells in us. We are the house of God. And that changes the way others interact with us. That changes the way we interact with others. Second Timothy 1, 7 says it this way. For the spirit of God in us does not make us timid, but gives us power love, and self-discipline. God's house is active. What are the other effects of having God dwelling in us? Psalm 91.1 says, Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Not only is God's house active, but it's chill. There's, you can rest there. And then in Galatians, we see that the Holy Spirit in us produces fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and then again, self-control. God's house is productive. This is what happens when God dwells in us. If you want to know if God is dwelling in you, just look for those things in your life. Believers, we are the house of God. And when somebody steps into interaction with me, they step into God's courtyard. God's courtyard allows easy access to the things that their soul needs. God's courtyard offers protection. It's a safe place for delicate conversations. God's courtyard offers provision through God himself who brings deep satisfaction. Like a host, like a good host in a home, God desires to reach through you and me to serve those around us. At the beginning of today's message, we said, if you can experience God in his house, you're going to know God on a much deeper level. So what does it mean then? If God's house is you and me, we can't experience God's house apart from each other. We've got to come together. And here at Grace Community Church, we are really good at this. 
in our most recent season of small groups, we saw over 650 people plugged into groups to experience God. This church knows the power of community. You, you truly are the courtyard of God. And I got to experience the courtyards of God uh, for myself firsthand. Back in 2016, I was still working as a closet designer, which was a 100% commission-based job, which I was excited about because I had lots of student loan debt to pay off. So I worked constantly. I worked nights. I worked weekends only to reward myself with the very cheapest meals that money could buy. <laughs> if you folks uh, doing the Financial Peace University, you know, it's, uh, you know, skimping out and, and cutting back on your spending. It's a good thing. But I had, I had taken it to an extreme. I was robbing myself of any opportunity to have a social life, and that included church. Uh, as a result, I developed some unhealthy coping mechanisms that only fueled more of the extreme lifestyle that I was in. And uh, I was in a downward spiral. And um, finally, I, I reached out to God just in prayer. I was crying out to him, um, longing for a change. And uh, I, tried, I tried connecting with some of the local churches, uh, but I wasn't really uh, meeting people that was, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't really connecting. I finally decided in my heart that this was so important to me that I would be willing to change anything about my life to reconnect with God again. And, uh, and then out of the blue, I remembered that a year earlier, I had gotten a text from my buddy, Christian Knuckles, to visit this cool new church that he attended. So a year later, I get back in touch with him um, and I get the info and I drive one hour from Annapolis to Arlington to, to see Grace Community Church for the first time. And I was welcomed in, open arms. And uh, during the service, John Coco got up on stage and announced an invitation to lunch. So I went to lunch. And then from there, um, another invitation from the young professionals there to play football at the park. So I went to the park. And then from there, I was invited to dinner afterwards. So I went to dinner. Um, and finally, after that, we parted ways and I drove home. <laughs> and if you're an introverted person, you're probably freaking out at my first day experience at Grace. But for me, uh, my God was providing what I had been longing for. And on my drive home, my heart was so full, I couldn't help but get little, little pools of tears in, in the yes, eye, eye water. It's not, you know, I wasn't crying. It's just, just some eye water. My, my valley of tears had transformed. And that whole day for me, all those people added up to this one feeling that I could describe to you as welcome home. God's house is a household of people. For those of you watching today who put your trust in God, who hold the doors open to the courtyards of God for people like me, I just want to say thank you. You stand alongside the households of history, like William Wilberforce, Mother Teresa, Dr. King, Mama Maggie, and so many others whose lives allowed for people to experience the protection and provision of God. Even now, during the pandemic, many of you are making the time to engage the conversation about racial equality and justice. And that's the kind of conversation that happens in Jesus' courtyard. For those of you who are maybe reluctant to embrace God as your home, I just want to remind you that God's invitation is open to you today. You can be a part of God's household today, right now. When Jesus died, the veil in the temple tore from top to bottom. You have full access to God right where you are. Think about this, God, God living in you. Um, HGTV, house hunters. Imagine God is, uh, he's, he's house hunting. He's going all over the place. He's figuring out what he likes, what he doesn't like, what his needs are, what his sense of style is. And then he sees you and he tells the agent, I'll take it. But the agent says, that's going to cost you an arm and a leg. And God says, no, no, it's worth way more than that. I'm going to pay with my whole body. Ephesians 2.19 says, Consequently, you are no longer strangers or foreigners, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. God, thank you for your sacrifice, which made an open invitation to all people to come and make their home in you. Would your spirit be welcome home in me? God, strengthen me 
to live in such a way that your courtyard is true to the owner of the house. Let anyone who steps into interaction with me discover the protection and provision of God. Amen. You and I are the house of God because God chose to dwell in Jesus and Jesus chooses to dwell in you and me. What a mystery. Let's reflect on that now in a time of worship. In this obsession with the things this world says make us happy Can't see the slaves we are in all the searching, all the grasping Like we deserve much more than all these blessings we're holding So now I'm running free into an ocean of mercy, unending. So come and empty me so that it's you I breathe. I want my life to be only Christ in me. So I will fix my eyes because you're my source of life. I need the world to see that it's Christ in me. That it's Christ in me Done with what holds me down The things I once was chasing after Throw off these heavy chains That I have let become my master So now I'm running free into an ocean of mercy unending so come and empty me so that it's you i breathe i want my life to be only christ in me so i will fix my eyes because you're my source of life i need the world to see that it's christ in me that it's Christ in me In this obsession with The things this world says make us happy Can't see the slaves we are In all the searching, all the grasping So come and empty me so that Hey again, everybody. Thanks for joining me at Grace in Five, where you can learn everything you need to know about a church for people who don't go to church in five minutes or less. This community is really about three things, Christ, community, and compassion. Jesus Christ is the center of all things. If church is a home, he is at the heart of it. Jesus' ability to share God with us and reunite us with God is unparalleled. His life and his teachings have impacted humanity on a scale where no other thing has come even close. When we wrestle with who God is and when we wrestle with who we are, we look to Jesus. In him, we find hope for the world and hope for ourselves. And Jesus is grace. Jesus is proof of our unmerited favor with God and where we find freedom from a life of trying to earn our way into a right relationship with God. The reason Grace Community Church has become so good at bringing people together is because of our focus on Jesus, who was the absolute best at bringing people together. People who were totally unlike each other, people who were religious, people who were non-religious, people who just everyone loved to be around Jesus. And so we make church about Jesus. And that's how we find ourselves with such an incredibly diverse community, full of people who have never been to church before, people who have been doing church their whole lives, people who look different from each other, people who think differently from each other. Out of our focus 
On Christ, we engage in community. Christ reminds us that we are made for community. Study after study comes out uh, proving that the quality of your life is directly affected by the people you share with. So here at Grace Community Church, we make engaging our community as easy as possible. Like we saw today, the house of God is his community of believers. And it's in that place where you find easy access to encouragement, challenge, growth, and so many of God's blessings. You can join a group today on trygrace.org slash groups. Christ's spirit in us leads us to compassion. The world around us is in desperate need, yearning and longing for what God can offer. Grace Community Church believes that we are the extension of God, his hands and feet in the world today. And that's why our youth went on uh, a trip last year to Guatemala to drill a well. Uh, That's why our Compassion and Justice Initiatives budget is the biggest piece of our grace budget pie. Our compassion efforts include service opportunities right through our church, as well as local and global partnerships with amazing organizations like Arlington Food Assistance Center, Bridges to Independence, and Casa Chirilago, just to name a few. If you want to learn more about how you can help change the world, I would encourage you to visit trygrace.org slash serve. So if you're new, we would love to be able to connect. Uh, You can click the button in the chat that says, I'm new, and share just a little bit of info with us so we can stay in touch. We would love for you to stick around uh, and connect in our virtual lobby over in the chat. We'll stay open for a little while as the uh, live prayer is still going on. And, uh, And I'll see you later this week with some short devotionals made just for you in our Grace app, downloadable from Google Play Store and Apple Store. Uh, That's it. Have a great afternoon, everyone.